Welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 5, Episode 12, titled Jack of All Trades. It originally premiered on March 3rd, 1989. It is written by Robert Ward, but the episode also shows that it's written by Ken Solars. Ken Solars wrote the teleplay. Robert Ward wrote the actual episode. They work in conjunction in a lot of stuff because this is Robert Ward's seventh writing credit. He wrote last week. He's still got one more coming. He's also the show's co-producer and Ken Solars, like, they're like two peas in a pod. Are we sure they're not the same person? <laughs> <laughs> the director is Vern Gillum. Now, come on. That name's got to sound familiar. Child's Play, Boroska, Hard Knocks, mm-hmm. Cows of October. <laughs> Got Cows of October written all over it this episode. <laughs> Which is going to be one of my sticking points in this episode and how it could have been better if you take cows as an example of how it could be better. <laughs> um, <laughs> take that into consideration. Before I start, I could check in soon to each other's lives. Pals, we have an announcement on how we're going to do the ending of the show. We asked people a while ago, how should we end it? Should we watch it in the order in which it aired on NBC, which would be episode 17 would be Freefall, the technical end of the show, and then the four lost episodes that aired on USA later and, and on NBC, uh, except for one. If we should watch it in that order, or if we should watch it in the order in which it was written to air which was the four lost episodes were in between, and then free fall. The conclusion has come to this moment right here, the decision. We are going to watch it the order in which it was written and supposed to air on TV and end this podcast on free fall, which I think is a natural fit because it would be really weird to do free fall and knowing like how the show is going to end and then come back and do the lost episodes, which I understand that's how historically that's how it aired. But for us telling a story, I think this is the order in which we watch it. I agree. I think it only makes sense to do it that way. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, it would be like one big flashback. Especially because as far as I understand it, I haven't seen it yet. But as far as I know, Valerie makes an appearance in Freefall. And then she's in one of the Lost episodes. There's story problems because of the order in which they were written versus when they aired. There's story problems because Freefall is clearly the end. There's no... (laughs) like. (laughs) the story is the end so <laughs> there's no yeah and there's no way to, to get around that let's just pretend nbc did it the right way instead of having to pimp out usa for <laughs> i think for us on the podcast too that's because we're gonna do the free fall episode and then we'll do our roundups and then the movie and that's the end of miami vice and it, it would i think It would be weird to then do the flashbacks, or not flashbacks, but the missing Mm -hmm. lost episodes after the official show end, and so kind of coincides with our show end, which if you don't want to see that, check out that Patreon. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you guys haven't seen it, so and you're going to be glad you made that decision, because it would be really weird to Mm -hmm. watch Freefall and then go on and watch the other ones. And that's why I was torn, is that historically, if I were to watch it as if we were watching it in the 80s, so we would would watch Freefall and then do the lost episodes. But that wasn't the way it was intended to be watched. No. And we have a choice here. And people that watched Vice in the 80s were very disappointed that there was these lost episodes. And they just jumped straight to the end. Um, I didn't know there were lost episodes. And I watched it in the 80s, obviously. Like, I, I didn't know those episodes existed because I didn't watch USA. So. <laughs> Unless it was up all night. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Or Silk Stockings. I was all about Silk Stockings. I love that show. But yeah. Ah, La Femme Nikita. <laughs> If it wasn't for USA Up All Night, I wouldn't A, have my love affair for trash movies, uh-huh. and B, I wouldn't know anything about Mystery Science Theater 3000. And you'd never see a bikini car wash. No. One through five. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about this episode that's got no bikinis in it, which you know would have been a step up from what we got. <laughs> <laughs> this was a very interesting episode that I think was missing one key player. Let's go break it down first. When we open up, we're at the Embassy Suites again. I mean, this is a pretty popular place. How much do you think they paid to be like the focal point of Miami in episodes in season five? I think they keep coming yeah, back that was because my of the thought. breakfast like, buffet. <laughs> <laughs> that was my thought. It's like, how many times are we going to return to this place? To have one hell of a food court. There's a man being chased by two other men. And it's like a Benny Hill type scenario where he's running around and then they like cross paths and one person looks lost as the, other, as the person they're chasing runs behind them and they're all over the place. These couple of good old fashioned Italians spread out <laughs> looking for him throughout the hotel. Jack, as we find out what his name is later, he runs into a shop and says, I want to buy a suit. 
goes in. I'm going to try it on right now. Those Italians come running in. They don't see him. They say, spread out, keep looking. He hands the woman who's there helping him pick out the suit, hands her the credit card, says, please go ring this up. I think I'm going to take it. She goes over to do it, and he sneaks out the back door. But then when she's running the credit card, she's like, what's a code 19? This card won't go through, and the owner is pissed. And for those who have worked in retail, code 19 is like, hit the red button, red flashing lights come pulling down from the ceiling. Time to call security to be a professional witness. <laughs> Melissa, you were one of those professional <laughs> witnesses. <laughs> I was. I, I used to work for Target. I was security <laughs> guard. <laughs> There's a lot to pack here. So first, this is one pretty epic gamma tag going on. Two, did he hand her a Diners Club card? Was that what <laughs> I was seeing? They deserve everything they get for accepting Diners Club. <laughs> When he sneaks out that back door and tries to escape, he thinks he's gotten away. But then when the elevator opens up, the security guard and the owner of the shop uh, are waiting for him. I also wanted to uh, talk about the incredibly horrible suit. Uh, <laughs> how did he sneak out as, as a pimp? <laughs> he looks like someone like those are the clothes that you would buy when you're on vacation. But you got wet, so you had to buy other clothes? Yeah, so you had to buy them at like some souvenir shop or something. Like every person who's ever been to San Francisco mm -hmm. in the summer, they all have the same San Francisco sweater. <laughs> we did Very not pack true. warm enough to come to this city. <laughs> I didn't bring a sweater. I guess we'll have to buy one at this gift shop. So when the security guard and the owner of the store catch him, they go walking right past those Italians and they don't grab him. And I have a question here. People that were chasing Jack, they were pushing other people into the fountains. They were ramrodding their way through this entire hotel trying to get Jack. But the security guard, the hotel security guard was too much to be able to cause them to just grab them and leave. Also, the security guards never got called on them pushing people into the fountains. I, I guess you get what you pay for with the cops. They did catch Jack. He was shoplifting, but two, they kind of missed the Italian thugs running through the <laughs> lobby. So, one out of two. I have a feeling they saw them on the security tapes and were like, nah, we're not going to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> they look too Italian to stop them. <laughs> so, down at the police station, Jack is telling the people, the police officers that are talking to him, I'm under deep cover. You can call Dan Quayle as a reference. <laughs> this is a matter of national security. <laughs> and fine, if you're not going to listen to me, call my FBI contact. At the precinct, Sonny gets a call and says, I didn't, I'm didn't. i not an FBI contact for anybody. Yeah, I'll come down there and come see what this is about. But you got the wrong person. Back at the police station, Jack's going on and on about Star Wars. Not, you know, like George Lucas Star Wars. Yes. <laughs> the Reagan Star Wars program that get Russian secrets and shoot down Russian missiles. You know, the one that never launched. Yeah, that one. Oh, oh uh, I, I'm sorry. I thought he was talking about Trump Space Force. And I was getting all excited. <laughs> Sonny and Tubbs are there. They travel over there together. And Sonny's listening to the person talk. He's like, wait a minute. I think I know who this person is. He comes walking in. And the officers ask him, do you know this person? He tries to say, no, I've never seen this person in my entire life. But just then, Jack spins around. It's like, what's up, cuz? And I love Tubbs' face here because he's like, cousin? You got a cousin? <laughs> How come you never told me you got a cousin? <laughs> I'm assuming that Buckets probably met everyone in Tubbs' family, including <laughs> like his relatives, friends and stuff. And then we go to the opening credits. Before we move on, this is our chance to check in with this week's guest stars. One of them is definitely identifiable as in like, ah, oh, that guy, he's in that he's in those things I've seen, but I've seen him in stuff before. I mean he's not that memorable, other than I recognize his face. John, what do you got for us this week? All right. Let's start with the big uh well. The big guest star this week is David Andrews, who plays Jack Crockett. Uh, his most famous characters he's played is he played General Robert Brewster in Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines, Gordon Biff well, in the final season of JAG. He played a title character in a couple TV series, one man and Machine, Pulaski, and The Monroes. Even in a couple big movies, but most is lots of TV movies. He's all over TV movies from the 90s and 2000s. He got his start in an episode of Trapper John MD, which is the uh, MASH spinoff. So his first uh, movie role was A Nightmare on Elm Street. Some other notable movies he's been in, Wyatt Earp, Apollo 13, and an appearance in Fight Club as well. Hey, you don't talk about that. His rules well, like against that. Mostly he's just been on TV. Guest appearances on shows like Just Shoot Me, Crossing Jordan. <laughs> 
I told you, every guest stars till the end of the show. CSI, <laughs> and his most recent is an episode of Justify. Still guest star in all kinds of TV shows. Our next guest star is Robert Miranda, who plays Ray Solis. So his first appearance was on an episode of Knight Rider in 83. His first movie was Inside Out. 86 you go on a pretty good run now i mean not very major parts in in a lot of these movies but he was in the untouchables in 87 midnight run in 88 which i think is his biggest part heat 95 and, and then the eraser in 96 13 days in 2000 this most recent movie being target in 2004 that michael mann connection is always so deep because he's in heat which is a Michael Mann movie. That brings us to our next guest star, Jesse Barago. He plays Octavio Escondero. He also played Rike Maraca Mendez in uh, the episode A Bullet for Crockett. We have a return villain, you guys. <laughs> He's the guy that shot Crockett then, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The drug dealer that shot Crockett. And now he plays the drug dealer who's going to kill Crockett's cousin. <laughs> different people though different people i mean yeah dude he's actually a pretty big actor his dad was actually an accordion player in a mexican band and he actually him and his sister were in a dance duo i have a question about him because i think i know i think i know him and this is i know who this guy is i think he grows up in the rock's shadow <laughs> and then he becomes roman reigns in the wwe and he, he you know he specializes in this certain move like the superman spear that he does <laughs> he looks just that's like what him. he looks like he does look like him yeah, yeah. A smaller more theatrical version <laughs> i mean if you could say someone's less theatrical than the wwe wrestler yeah that's true <laughs> Well, he actually, he, he graduated from the California Institute of Arts along with Don Cheadle. He's actually been in some decent stuff. He's known for playing Jesse Velasquez in the TV series Fame from 84 to 87. He played Gail Ortega on the TV show 24. I know him best as George King in the Dexter in, in the 2008. He also played Cruz Candelaria in uh, blood in blood out for you blood in and blood out fans there's rumors of a sequel blood in and blood out 2 which he have has you, signed on for well, have you guys never rumors. seen that movie no uh. no <laughs> as okay. i said i know him best as george king from dexter <laughs> okay so i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry we should all know him starring in scooby-doo and the monster of mexico <laughs> oh of course Okay, our last guest is John Santucci. And John Santucci played Henry Grubbs, also played Dale Menton in The Golden Triangle 2, and Charlie Fusco in the episode for Lombard. So, three, three different characters for John <laughs> Santucci. But essentially the same and, character. And just in case, <laughs> yes, yeah. And just in case, those other two times I didn't mention this, Santucci was a jewel thief before being hired by Michael Mann. He, he <laughs> appeared in and was a technical advisor for his 1981 movie Thief, which also featured Dennis Farina, who played a cop, who was Dennis Farina, who was a real Chicago cop who actually arrested John Santucci <laughs> for robbery in Chicago. They basically just made a movie about Dennis Farina in real life arresting John Satucci. Uh, literally, Dennis Dennis played the cop, John played the thief, and it was uh, actually based on a heist that Satucci, one of Satucci's robberies. Just made a movie about Dennis arresting him. They would go, he would go on from that to be cast in, guess what, guys? Crime Story with Dennis Farina. <laughs> Why go in a good thing? Dennis would play a cop. He would play a mob boss. It's got to work. He was a jewel thief. <laughs> he would also be in the movie, uh, the TV movie, L.A. Takedown, which is obviously the pre-TV movie version of Heat, uh, another Michael Mann connection. But outside of Michael Mann stuff, his only other appearances were Wise Guy, uh, The Flash, and something called Point Man, whatever that is. Something to do with jewel thievery. <laughs> Unfortunately... Santucci's TV career Wolf would fizzle out in the early 90s and he would return to a life of crime. During the 90s, he would be charged with multiple counts of theft by deception, including pleading guilty in 94 when caught with over 100 items classified as burglary tools. <laughs> Not items <sighs> stole, just the tools. Uh, I wonder if Dennis Farina arrested them that time, too. I wonder if he caught him. 
When we come back from the opening credits, we're at the police station and the shop owner is pissed. I want to prosecute him to the fullest extent of the law for trying to run a bad credit card. And Sonny's like, you've been arrested two times before, did a couple years in the joint, just recently got picked up for trying to sell stolen goods. How about you hit the road? And he's like, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I changed my mind. Good old police intimidation. <laughs> Perfect way to get your cousin, you know, go into jail. After Eddie, that's the shop owner's name, after he leaves, Tubbs is like, so how come you never told me about Jack? I mean, I thought we were best friends. I and mean, here we are, like, you got a cousin you never even told me about. <laughs> Long uh, lost cousin. I, I do like Crockett's life. He would cheat on a blood test. <laughs> he also refers to him as Dandruff. Well, I mean, he is like <laughs> Dandruff. <laughs> When he goes to talk to his cousin, his cousin was apparently out west and said, did, did he say he started a dude, dude ranch? Is that, <laughs> am, I, am I thinking of the right thing? I'm pretty sure that's what he was saying. And Jack is also saying, I have a regular full-time job. I do sales now for a place. And Sonny's like, what, for selling Velcro toupees? And Jack says, no, no, no. No, don't be silly. No, see, like, Captain, I was going, I'm on the straight and narrow. Well, I am now, as of this moment. Before this, I wasn't, and I was being chased through the embassy suites. But right now, I'm straight and narrow. See, here's my business card to World of Waves. Captain Mike's World of Waves. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Mike becomes an important character because we find out Captain Mike is secretly Harry. <laughs> Sonny's like, I got to see this. I got to see you sell pool supplies. Because Jack says that he's been here for a couple weeks. So they head over to the World of Waves. Sonny is watching Jack sell this filter to this guy. And he actually does a really great job of selling those nails. <laughs> I going to say, man, he does a fantastic job selling this guy a shop vac. I mean, <laughs> he could seriously sell these on an infomercial. And that's what this scene kind of feels like. It's an infomercial for shop vacs. <laughs> it works too he shows him in the demo that it works and this guy that he's talking to he's like nah it's too expensive i can't take it he steps outside he's giving him the whole glenn gary process hard sells him he gives him the evidence he steps out lets him think about it he comes back in it's like sorry i can't do it my boss sunny out there waiting in the <laughs> other room says that i can't sell it to you for that price and he says okay fine i'm gonna leave he's like okay if you're gonna pay cash i'll take it and the man says can i pay you in cuban cash <laughs> Question. So wouldn't that be pesos? <laughs> Pretty sure it is. There's how an would, embargo on yeah, Cuba. I was say, like, how did he get the, how did he get the I, cash? I'm more curious. He wrote down a number. Then the other guy wrote down a number that was obviously smaller. And then now that number's in pesos. So does that mean we got, like, divided by, like, seven or ten or what's the exchange rate at this point? This is similar to what me and Melissa are going through earlier today where we're trying to convert grams to cups. How nope. many tablespoons in an uh, ounce and how many ounces in a gram? It was really hard. <laughs> so later, out at this Cubano's house, Jack comes pulling up. Oh, He's been summoned out to the Cubano's house. This Cubano is terrible. He starts in with this terrible accent. All I got out of this scene was he thinks it's a gam and that bees <laughs> of gobbled garbage <laughs> and something about a couch <laughs> did i convey the scene <laughs> jack says i just want to make it right he's like damn right you are because we're going to kill you unless you don't make it right this black sludge is just spewing into the cubano's pool and he sees at the corner of his eyes like hey what are those guys doing down there and someone mentions to the cubano like the, the, the shipment has arrived like, how about you mind your own business? The patio I'm going to go take care of this. Yeah, yeah, my patio furniture has arrived. Jack's pretty lucky that the patio furniture showed up like it did, because he was pretty mad. <laughs> so, of course, Jack, you know, he's he's underwater here. He's he's trying to go straight and narrow. And instead of paying the cash back, he, does, he pays the cash back. And then he drives around the block and goes and spies on what the Cubano is trafficking, which will, which actually isn't important. Because that will never come up again about like what kind of drugs it is or anything. The only thing we ever talk about is the money. I thought it was actually patio furniture. <laughs> Back at the Waves office, the Italianos. I'm going to call them from here on. I'm not going to call anyone by their name. They don't deserve it. <laughs> I've been referring to him as Captain Mike. So we're at Captain Mike's <laughs> office now. They come in and talk to Jack and they want their money. Jack says, it's not my fault you lost your money. I told you there was risk to this investment. 
But the Italiano says, I don't care about any of that. I want my $50,000 back, and I'm going to get it one way or another. And Jack tries to talk his way out of it by saying, you remember when we went to Big Bear, we went skiing, and there was all this stuff. And the Italiano is like, I don't care about any of that stuff. Everything always works out for you. I got chased by a bear. But you want to make sure everything works out for you. Well, this time it's not going to work out for you. I want my money. The business he invested 50K in was a kosher ch- Chinese food restaurant. <laughs> I think Captain Mike might be uh, covering from a stroke. <laughs> Captain Mike has given Jack 24 hours to pay him back. So now we go out to the Cubano's house. And Jack, we all, I mean, it's pretty obvious that it's Jack. He breaks into the house, finds the boss counting money. And robs him at gunpoint while wearing a cat mask while using a not fake- a cat mask. Not cat. It's a mount. It's a rat mask. So uh, he's basically like, "Freeze! Give me all your cheddar and your gouda too." <laughs> he's using a really bad Hispanic accent too. And the because the the Cubano doesn't have his bodyguards with him, he asks. He gives him the money, and then Jack's able to leave, and he's been able to escape with the $50,000. Jack pulls up to his house, and Crockett's already there. Sonny has a six-pack, and he wants to catch up. He's like, hey, we're family. Just want to see what's going on. And Jack's trying to say, I can't. I, I got a date. I got a date with a lady named June, and she... June uh, Porch. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny says, hey, let's go inside, but I want to stop here for a moment. After season one, we pretty much stopped seeing Sonny drink. And in this episode, he's drinking a lot. When Jack pulls up, he's already Mm. drank a beer. And later, we'll see him with more beers. And then even later, we'll see him getting extra drinks at the bar. I don't know where this is going, but I'm... I I guess he gave up on being the world's greatest dad. (laughs) I noticed that too this episode. I was like, man, he's really hitting it hard. Like he almost never drinks. Actually, I thought he was sober because we never see that happen. It you stop seeing him drink at about the time you stop seeing him smoke. Tubbs and Dad need to have an intervention. I, I, I think he needs to <laughs> spend too much time with me. Stan. <laughs> Blame poor Stan. <laughs> Obviously, he's not acting. Jack's not acting suspicious at all. He actually does have a date with June Porch. <laughs> uh, which is why it's so confusing that he completely stands her up. If you've seen her, she's she's a beautiful porch. <laughs> uh, almost certain he's squatting in someone else's house. Quite possibly he's also being fumigated. So <laughs> it could potentially be dangerous that these two are hanging out here. But all of that aside, as Crockett is giving him the third degree on the sly, you know, kind of testing him. Somehow, the phone's, and it's for Crockett, which <laughs> should be impossible, <laughs> right? We were like, how did they know to call that number? Yes, so if he's squatting in that house with all the furniture underneath sheets, how does anyone have that phone number? Am I the only one that noticed that in that kitchen there is a staircase that goes nowhere? <laughs> I didn't notice that. So in wh- <laughs> where, 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 that either. where Sunny walks in, there's like this, this, what should be like the beginning of like a spiral staircase, but it goes into the wall. There's like no opening to get into the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, unless I just can't figure it out, you'll have to go back and maybe you'll prove <laughs> me wrong, but tell me where those stairs go. <laughs> How do you get into those stairs? Or maybe, I don't know what it is. It's like a round uh, maybe, staircase thing. Maybe, maybe the wall, maybe it's a secret wall that opens up and that's where he's keeping the family that actually lives here. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way that Crockett ends the scene too. So after he gets his phone call from, he goes, oh man, I gotta go. Some idiot ripped off a mob boss, you know, is about to get killed. Gotta go. Question two. How does Vice know that a mob boss got ripped off for thousands? Did he call it in? <laughs> yeah. like, Someone robbed me. <laughs> <laughs> Someone robbed me. They stole all my drug money. Get out of here. They stole $50,000 in counterfeit money. I'd like you to find it. Oh, wait, this is Florida. This potential could be Florida man that would call in being robbed for $50,000 in counterfeit money. Do you think that's how they get, like, they close, like, half their cases? People calling in, I was robbed. They stole all my drugs. Question three. Why would Jack be nervous about answering his phone if he's given the phone number out? So obviously he gave it out so that Sonny knew how to call him. And they gave it to the vice team and he's giving it to other people how can he's so nervous to answer the phone there's too many questions in this. i don't know let, let, let's go back to captain mike's maybe he has some answers or he's gonna have another stroke one of the two <laughs> jack pops into the restaurant he's paying back his italian mafia and captain mike says i'm happy 
thanks, but I'm never going to do business with you again. So then Jack heads home and he pulls up a pizza and beer. It's like, I'm going to have a good day. I mean, it's not on the same level as like having a bag of porn. <laughs> no one can yeah. do that happen. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like, this is going to be a good day. And just as he gets to the front door, two men grab him, punch him, throw him in the trunk of the car and leave. And they just leave their pizza on the ground. Monsters. <laughs> Jesus. Henchmen these days. <laughs> Please bring the pizza with you. So they show back up at the Cubano's house, and they're beating Jack up some more, and take him in to see the Cubano. And who's doing, like, the worst Tony Montana impersonation? It's like Tony Montana and the Godfather, if they were to have... Dude, <laughs> a terrible... <laughs> this episode... An ugly love child. <laughs> this whole episode has been a competition between every single one of them to do their worst Tony Montana impression. Like, everyone gets their opportunity to do it. When he robbed him, he pretended to have a Cuban accent. We've I've already talked about the guy who thought it was a gam. <laughs> Now we get Prince uh, trying to do his best impression. <laughs> the only one that doesn't is Burnett. Had he been given time, included in on the contest, he, maybe he would have tried a Cuban accent too. <laughs> Must not have been very good because he was right away. He was like, I know it was you, prick. I know because you have the same dumb pink shoes. Jack says that money was drug money, but the Cubano says, I don't care if you don't my business. I want my money back. You got Now you got 24 hours to pay me back. So now Jack's going to head back over to the Captain Mike's restaurant. And he's having dinner with, I think, just one person. I don't know. He's doing the most Italian thing possible, which is sit at a table and talk to everyone around him at other tables. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jack's ideas. He throws out Handbag City, where they could use throw away animals to make purses it'll only cost him conveniently 50 grand to invest <laughs> there's no red flags to get flied up the flagpole when the person who just paid you back fifty thousand dollars earlier that day is now back and says i'd like my money back please jack is down low to him and says i gotta have it otherwise they're gonna kill me and captain mike says all right fine he caves or at least we think he caves but then we find out Real quick, in the next scene, as our terrible um, pretend Cubans are about to play a game of whack-a-mole on Jack, that he gave him fake money, which my question is, is why does Harry, a.k.a. Captain Mike, have 50 grand worth of fake money just lying around? Exactly. Exactly. And that's what's going to come up. And Melissa, that's what you were saying. It's like, oh, it looks like Escondero, which is what the Cubano says. That's who you ripped off. It wasn't me. That's actually Escondero's money. Melissa, you were saying, oh, it looks like Escondero and Captain Mike are in business together. Exactly, because how would Captain Mike have that counterfeit money? <laughs> well, yeah, why would they both have ca- Why do they bo- both have counterfeit money? What is going on here? <laughs> so at the club that night, Sonny's supposed to be meeting up with Jack, and there's Sonny out on the street having another drink. Yeah, he's like drinking while he's waiting for him to show up. It's like, what's going on there, Sonny? Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, Jack is getting beat up at Escondero's because he says... You paid me back in fifty thousand dollars in counterfeit money that I just gave to someone else a few days ago. Why would I accept your counterfeit money? Yeah, it was my own counterfeit money. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to be fair, he's being pretty understanding about this. He even gives him a whole another hour because he says his plight intrigues me, which just <laughs> makes me think that these people are just stupid. <laughs> and then he stood up cocked his arm, punched the ground. <laughs> <laughs> you leave Roman Reigns alone. Jack says, I can get your money in the hour. Escondero, like you said, John, he's like, make this exciting for me. <laughs> but he says, you have to take two of my men with you. So they go to the club. That's where Sonny is waiting. Jack pulls up and he calls Sonny over and Sonny can see from distance like, oh, Jack, what'd you get yourself mixed up into this time? But he comes over like, hey, Jack, buddy, what's going on, pal? Hey, let's, let, hey, you got some cool friends here. This is a nice looking car. Oh, no, my beer. Blammo. <laughs> <laughs> He's able to close yeah, you know, I- Jack out of the back of the car. <laughs> Oh, man, just like they practiced. It's like that one time at summer camp when uh, Jack owed that guy uh, 50000 and, you know. <laughs> They're able to barely get away as the Cubanos or Escondero's men try to shoot at them, but then they miss and they have to drive away because there's too many witnesses. Question, does no one call the police for drive-by shootings in Miami anymore? No, it's a regular thing. 
They're like, oh, it's sunny. Yeah. Don't worry about it. It's just sunny. <laughs> so sunny and Jack get away. And this is probably my favorite scene of the episode because Sunny starts to take this jacket off. He's taking off his cups and starts setting everything <laughs> down next to it. And he's gonna he's like keep ready to give him a good old family whooping. <laughs> I am gonna beat the crap out of you for dragging me into this. I'm going to do a CIA black site interrogation on you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It takes Jack a minute to realize what's happening. Like at first he's all like, oh man, this is great. Me and you against the world, you know? And then he starts to realize like, oh, you're taking your gun off, Sonny. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny's like, you're going to give me all the information. And Jack's like, you don't like me. I'm sad. You always hated me. You were always the favorite. Jack does have a good point here where he says, you were the golden boy. You went to college, played football. You were a war hero. You came back and became a cop. You couldn't do anything wrong. And me, I'm just like my dad, a drunk and a loser and a grifter. And Sonny tries to cheer him up by saying, remember that motorcycle you used to have? I, used to, yeah, I thought you were the coolest guy around. And Jack even turns that around on him. Is Crockett supposed to be younger than him? <laughs> 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 because um I'm just I didn't saying, even think about that. I love you, Don Johnson. I do. But you got some life going on on your that. face <laughs> to tell me that those two <laughs> actors are like the same age. So how much younger you is mean, Crockett supposed to be? <laughs> you mean Crockett's not in his twenties in this? <laughs> that's, that's what I'm saying. He's acting like he was a kid, and that Jack had a motorcycle, and he used to watch him ride it, and he thought I thought you were, the, unless he was just a dork, and he was just, they were the same age. <laughs> so the point is terrible because he basically says you were selfish, and you never gave me a ride on your motorbike, <laughs> and so <laughs> tough cookies. It goes both ways. I'm like, not gonna I, help I, you I, now. I don't see. I don't see what having a cool motorcycle. It uh, has to do with the fact that Sonny was a star athlete, a war hero, and is now a, an accomplished police officer. Like, he didn't have a cool doesn't motorcycle. Doesn't seem equal here. It doesn't seem he can rent them. We know we know he's capable of renting cool motorcycles. <laughs> Seen that. Either way, Sonny says, "Just give me a name. Give me a name I can work with." And Jack says, "Escondero." And Sonny immediately lights up. Escondero. What? <laughs> Commercial break. Quick scene of them driving their head. Now Sonny says, stick to the script. We're going to go make a move here. No backup. No telling anyone. Just Sonny's going to go take care of this. Keep going. going to break out see Burnett. <laughs> At Escadero, Sonny is laying on the Burnett charm. I can get you into this deal. I know my cousin has been an idiot. He's slapping him around in front of Escadero and says, let's make a deal here. They step aside and say, I'm moving some big time pharmaceuticals. You can get in on this deal. That'll help cover the debt from my dumbass cousin. And Escondero buys it. Says, sounds good to me. I'll, I want in on this. And so then when they leave from Escondero's, Jack's happy. No, says, no, no. Really not well exactly. Together. Not exactly. So Sonny says he's moving tons of pharmaceuticals, but, but then he turns to Escondero and says, but can I buy pharmaceuticals from you? And somehow he makes it work. <laughs> like he, try, he convinces him he's this big time baller, but then can I buy a few million dollars worth of pharmaceuticals from you? It's like, wait a minute. I thought you had connections. I thought you were going to make this deal to pay back this money. So when they stop off at this bar slash club thing, Jack's like, we work really well together. We should go into business together. And you can see Sonny's face just drop. You still don't get it, do you? And then he orders another drink. He orders a double, actually. So Jack, all high on his bust on Escondero or Ro Roman Reigns, He's high. He's all high on his Buster Roman Reigns. He goes over to Captain Mike and says, "You gave me fifty thousand dollars in fake money, and I'm gonna have my cousin, a Miami cop, come bust you down." And that wasn't even the best part about this, because when he walks in, you see Captain Mike. He is smiling at a cannoli. He like. <laughs> Shaking his head like a good ass cannoli. <laughs> no, it's more like I'm gonna eat you. <laughs> I'm gonna eat you today. It's a very agreeable cannoli. <laughs> Not only does he sell out his cousin about being a cop, but he practically tells him like, "Yeah," and his name's Sonny Crockett, but he goes by Sonny Burnett on the street. Like, watch out for him. <laughs> so later that night, Captain Mike is with Roman Reigns, and they're riding in a limo. Well, when Rain says, here's $200,000 in fake money, but be sure not to spend it locally. And Captain Mike says, no He's problem. He's kidding this fake cash. <laughs> he says, no problem. I'm going to take it out of the area. I wouldn't be crazy enough to do it in my own area. And Roman Reigns is like, 
then how come this guy that came into my office and tried to pay me $50,000 of my own counterfeit money? Like, what do you look like? Like, oh, he's kind of a scrawny, you know. Like a schlub, basically, mm-hmm. is what he calls him, like a screw-up. Captain Mike says, oh, yeah, his cousin's heat. Everybody in the, in the limo is like, record scratch, what? <laughs> Heads turned from the front. Yeah, they even look behind them, which I thought was silly. <laughs> like, what, is he going to pop out from behind the seat? So now we're to the meet, and this is when Sonny's deal is supposed to go down. He's going to bring down Escondero. No backup. No one even knows where, what he's doing. No, no. Stan nope. comes later. No, Switek knows that they're what they're doing. He knows because he's the one that got no. was supposed to get the money, right? Yeah, he's like, I have no, to tell Stan. No, he was about, just driving me. <laughs> he's like, I have to tell Stan because Stan's going to get the money, and we're and mm. that, so yeah, Stan's driving there. Like you could see him. He, he, where he did Stan that. get Finny from? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so confused. Is but there he, just like a store that you can pick up fake money at? But I think what happens is. They take him from his house, not that he ever gets to the, he didn't get to the meet on his own. They show up at the house with the gun and they drag him away earlier than when he was supposed to be at the meet. So mm-hmm. That's why it takes Stan some time to get there, like, because he thinks the meet's still at this certain time and shows up like, you know, 20 minutes too late. <laughs> <laughs> so why didn't we get a scene of Stan stealing the money? No, but he's already got the... F- I'm confused. <laughs> All I know is when he says, I have to, I have to call Stan and he has to be in on this too you okay. have to know what's all going right, on right. that's Let, all i know so let's get back to this this deal roman reigns is standing up top on the balcony about to give us a shakespeare <laughs> yes. uh performance it looks like crockett and and jack are doomed they're about they've been figured out and they're about to be killed instead they lock him in a supply closet <laughs> At first, I thought he was actually pummeling Jack. Okay, that makes sense. I'd beat his ass too. But apparently, it was an elab- elaborate ploy to get them to let him out of the closet. And then it's a Benny Hill chase slash shootout. And not only that, but Sonny just murders the entire Escondero gang, including telling Escondero to freeze. Escondero does freeze. And he and still shoots still him. shoots him. Yeah, he's like, freeze. He's yes. like, okay, I'm freezing. And then he shoots him dead. <laughs> All you see are those sleeves flying yeah. up in the air when he goes out. <laughs> <laughs> That's when we see Stan driving by and he hops out and comes running over. End up on the dock and they can't find Jack. And then we see the boat taking off and you know it's Jack and he's got the 50 grand. And Crockett's, well, let him go. It's not like he's committed 10 felonies throughout this episode. <laughs> Yeah, uh, he can go because oh. I never want to see him again. But what's bugging me is that that's when Crockett reveals that the 50 grand that he's driving away with in the boat is fake. Well, wait a minute. If Crockett went over there with 50 grand to pay back his debt, why is it fake money then? Where did Zwyta get the fake 50 grand from? And also, why is that okay? Why can Sonny just make that determination? Is it because Castillo's still in the hospital clinging to life? And Sonny's like, yeah, 50,000? Go for it. Well, I mean, I think he was going to arrest Eskin, whatever his name is. I can't even say his name correctly. Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns. He was going to arrest Roman Reigns after yeah. he did it. So I guess I don't know. Yeah, I don't know where he got the. I, I mean, think maybe they have it in the. They have it in uh, evidence lockup. They just have but Stan <laughs> counterfeit okay. money. Stan didn't know it was counterfeit, though. Because he says this is an apartment issue. They took the $50,000. And suddenly it's like it's counterfeit. Yeah. So Stan didn't know it was counterfeit. So, like, I get Roman Reigns apparently having two hundred and fifty grand of fake money. But where did Sonny get the fifty grand of fake money? And how come Switek didn't know when he's the one that procured it? Good question. <laughs> Burn Gillum, ah, where are you? We got questions for you. And they freeze frame on Sonny's shitty and grin as he walks away. <laughs> and with no utter disregard for now the entire crime world will know who Sonny Burnett is. That's the best part about this episode where he goes like, I wonder how they found out. Or how did they get my, <laughs> blow my cover? Who blew my cover? I'm like, um, you blew your cover everywhere you go, you dummy. <laughs> how many, how many <laughs> drug dealers have you locked up? Wait, <laughs> wait, wait. How can he continue to use Sonny Burnett if Sonny Burnett was the mass murdering king of South Beach? Well, I mean, I think that's how you how could do that. He, <laughs> he just disappeared one day. Like how everyone could he, thought he was dead. How could he still use Sonny Burnett when he is wanted by bloodthirsty pirates? He's wanted I by- haven't forgot you, Frank Zappa. <laughs> I haven't forgot you. He's wanted by everyone in South Beach. He ramrodded everyone in that area. He screwed over so many people, killed so many people. 
took over so many routes, screwed so many truck drivers who were the the delivery people. Everyone should she know. She started who a drug union. Is. Yeah, I mean it's true. It's another one of those things that Miami Vice is hoping you don't think about. <laughs> <laughs> Before I get too far into my final thoughts, let's go take a look at this week's music because it is hilarious <laughs> that we've got to have John talk about th what they got in this week's music. So let's talk about that first. All right, John. Normally I see a funny band name and I'm like, oh, this is going to be good. And then I saw that it's the same band for all the songs in this episode. And then I saw the band names like this is going to be even better. What do you got for us this week? We have three songs in the episode. Songs are Fugue number five in D minor, Aria, and Invention number one in C major. If that's an indication that this music's a little bit different than the normal music we talk about here, the name of the band should get you the rest of the way. This is by Swingle Singers. <laughs> Now, I thought Swingle Singers was a play on words like swingers and single, but apparently it was formed by a guy named Ward Swingle. So apparently it's just <laughs> his last name. Swingle Singers. And they're an a cappella group from Paris, France. They've been around since 1962. Still around today, but even while the membership's changed numerous times, all the way up until 2011, they maintained eight members during two bass, two tenors, two altos, and two sopranos. In 2007, one of the members left and they just stuck with seven members and so it kind of screwed everything up. <laughs> Guys, we haven't talked about acapella group before. You would think this and acapella group would not go together at all. Swingle Singers sounds like a Harvard club that fraternities would make fun of. <laughs> but they're actually pretty successful. They won five Grammys. Can you believe that? Five Grammys. Wow. Their music has pretty much mostly graced the background of many TV series. Ranging from West Wing to Glee, movies including Thank You for Smoking and Wedding Crashers. They've actually got some pretty good uh, credits. Ultimately, the story, Swingles Singers, they were all background vocalists for Mimi Perrin's French vocal group, Les Double Six, which I don't understand why the first part's in French and the second part's in English, but <laughs> I don't get, I don't know. But yeah, so they were all backup singers uh, for that, and they actually uh, somehow, like, they... They were the swing swingle singers of Lay Double Six or something until uh, until 1973 when the original group members disbanded and Ward Swingle would move to London and hire a bunch of new members. Uh, screw those other guys. <laughs> we're gonna be we're gonna be Swingle Two. <laughs> You would go on to make music. They would release their first album called Jazz Sebastian Bach. And it was basically made as a present for family and friend. Just something they could hand out to their family and friends. Hobby a cappella group would do. Actually, a bunch of radio stations picked it up and actually played it on, on air. It would lead to many, many more albums, which would lead to their music being used in film and TV. But what's crazy about it is that Ward Zwingle started the group in 1962. He broke it off and hired a whole new band in 73. They would continue to every time that they would lose a member, they would hold an audition and bring in a new member to maintain that eight member two by two by two. By two, and they would keep going. Ward Zwingle, by the way, would die at the age of 87 in 2015. Mm. But the group still lives on. <laughs> the most recent member to join was in, announced in November 2018. She's going to join coming next year. She's going to join the group. Her name is Emojin Perry, and she is the daughter of former member Ben Perry. So it's like now their kids are joining the band. <laughs> like it's just it's just Swingle Singers is going to go on forever. Yes. Ridiculous name, a, an a cappella group, a ridiculous idea who is actually a famous probably the only famous a cappella group that I can think of cuz I, I don't know, can you name it a famous a cappella group? Uh, the pan what's the pantatonics or whatever. That's the one that's now the Mormon Tabernacle <laughs> Choir. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're not famous. I mean, come on. They don't have any credits. They they've never been featured on West Wing. <laughs> True. Five Grammys, Dominic. Five Grammys. <laughs> Guys want the Led Zeppelin of acapella groups. There you go. 
I shouldn't say Led Zeppelin. <laughs> what would be a good group that would represent uh, one that changed members a bunch? I don't know. I'll have to think I about it. Uh, <laughs> They're like the Wu Tang Clan of. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Swingle Singers is the acapella version of the Wu Tang Clan. That is what they are. That's all I could think about was how there's like 20 million members and they change. And either that or Slipknot, right? And <laughs> no, no, no. I That is perfect. And now I want to start a GoFundMe to try and get Swingle Singers to start covering Wu Tang Clan songs. <laughs> Because I think that would be awesome. This is an acapella version of Cream. All right. We're, <laughs> we're, we're going to work on this on our end. Uh, let, let, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and get to our final thoughts. <laughs> Wu Tang. Wu Tang. <laughs> Jazz hands. All right, Melissa. I'm going to let you kick off this week on final thoughts. Set the table for us. Vice veteran, where should we stand on this episode? It's a fun episode, right? I mean, it's goofy. It's fun. I'm a little disappointed. I think they should have done a different story since he talked about his brother in the episode with his with Billy. Jake. Billy. <laughs> but his brother's name's Jake. Oh, okay. I'm like, oh, yeah. Why didn't Bobby. he use his- why didn't they use his brother? It would have been like the perfect opportunity. Even after he told that story about his brother Jake holding that guy, that yeah. kid's face down in the mud till he died. I mean, like, right? He, he talked about. Like, I'm like, yeah. yeah, I mean, he killed that kid for him. I mean, no, but I'm saying, like, he talked about how he like looked up to his brother and his brother protected him. Like, what would have been better? His brother is like a screw up. He comes to town. He's trying to help him, and also. I kind of find this episode a little bit sad because it really is like Crockett does want to hang out with him, but he just keeps blowing him Think. off and he keeps screwing up and like doing all these stupid things. So, but but he really does want to hang out with him. Like he really does want to have dinner with him, get beers with him, and it it and also he you know he wants he's trying to figure out what he's doing. But it's sad to me that Crockett is like, oh, my family's in town. <laughs> I really want to hang out, but I don't well, understand. Yeah, he wants what, to hang out and get drunk. Yeah, exactly. But I don't understand why Tubbs is surprised he has a cousin. Like, do you know everything about him? I mean, it's a weak episode in story. <laughs> it makes up for it with the, with the music they chose, I guess. I don't know. Also, the guy who thinks he's doing Shakespeare. I don't know what kind of calm you're trying. I don't know what kind of calm you're playing. John, what are your final thoughts? So... <laughs> So I, I'm a little caught off guard as Melissa made me think of something when she was saying hers. Do you guys think that maybe Jack is Jake and that maybe, I, I don't know, maybe he just talked about him, talked him up or I, I don't know. It's just weird that Jack oh, and I Jake, I mean, they're pretty close. Like maybe Jake didn't actually exist. Yeah. Maybe it's actually his cousin. He was talking yes. about not his brother. He just feels like he's his brother because he's just, like older. And he was like with him all the time or something. Yeah. Cause I mean, he even says, you know, remember when you had that Indian motorcycle, I thought you were the coolest guy in the whole world. I looked up to you. Maybe Jack is Jake. Could be, I don't I know. Mean, yeah. Throwing a fan theory out there. Maybe they're the same person. <laughs> We want to hear from you. Do you think maybe that's why he's so to drink with them? Yeah, yeah. Email, email, go with you to gmail.com. Let us know because a, that, that's a solid point. Like Jake doesn't actually exist. He doesn't have a brother. So, but he didn't want to tell his son that because that didn't, that wouldn't fit for his story. Yeah. So, email us. Let us know what you mm-hmm. think. Is that is, is Jake real or is he really mean Jack? Also, he's never talked about having a brother ever before mm-hmm. that especially since jack's such a screw-up so of course when he's telling his son that story he doesn't want to tell him like yeah your uncle jack's a screw-up you exactly. know he's a con man now you know exactly. he's trying to so all right well that that aside i feel like it's been because we know this is the final season it's been a little bit of a weird season because it kind of started out on a very serious note we got a little bit silly we got back to being serious we haven't gotten back to being silly yet and i feel like this is us getting back to being silly but it just feels weird because it's been so long since we've since we've had that like season two silliness that season two season three so and that's <laughs> almost what this episode kind of felt like i can appreciate the the crockett storyline in it i'm starting to really kind of miss the the girls i i haven't seen the girls or had them have a big role in an episode and in what feels like a really long time so i'm hoping that this next episode or so we we get back to involving everybody in the vice 
uh, squad. Exactly. And that's all I was going to say is that these silly episodes are great when the whole team is involved. For as much as people don't like cows or they don't like and missing hours, amen, send money, like those ones that are really serious or even the Rastafarian popsicle. What makes them okay is that the whole team is involved. And I love it when Vice gets silly. They have very, very serious episodes. And the next episode is going to be extremely serious, The Cell Within, which is a tub story. So it's okay. That, it's, for me, it's okay that they go to Silly Town. But I like it when they bring the whole team and not have just one. And speaking of the whole mm-hmm. team, how is Izzy not in this episode? It's got Cuban gangsters. And if you needed Jack to be mixed up in a partner, then Izzy should have been his person that was enabling him. And then they could have brought, and then Sonny could have been trying to lash out at Izzy too. Like, why are you bringing my cousin into this? Why are you being such an idiot? Izzy must have gotten off parole or something. They must not have anything to hang over his head anymore. <laughs> so in my opinion, this episode is worse than Cows. Because at least Cows has got everybody. Stan and the ladies and Castile, like it involves everyone. And this is strictly a Sunny episode. Like literally, you don't, Castile or the girls, you don't see them at all. Yeah, and also Tub is only in it for like five minutes. Like, it's just the beginning. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, and what's so weird about it, too, is that this season has been so Crockett heavy compared to the other characters. Yet yeah, Crockett, um, Don Johnson was the only one that could do other projects. Everybody else just had to do Vice. It's like you would think that like toward the end, like Don Johnson would be doing other projects and they would have to like focus in on the other characters to keep the show going. Like most... Like, like most of the time when's the situation, but it's almost it's almost the opposite. So this is a bad episode. And as I mentioned, this is I would take missing hours or Counts of October or Amen Send Money any day of the week over this. And I love it when Vice gets silly, but you gotta involve everyone. You can't just have it just be one person. You gotta have Trudy do something mm-hmm. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Trudy and peanut butter. They go hand in hand. <laughs> And that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. I just fired some shots. <laughs> shots fired. <laughs> I just said this episode's worse than what I consider to be the worst episodes in the whole run of the season. Or the whole the whole run of the series. Email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com. Let us know what your thoughts are on that. Don't forget to email us about our new fan theory, which I don't think existed before, about Jack and Jake being the same uh, same person. Exactly. Exactly. Let us know what you think about Jack and Jake. Email us, goldtheheat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out that website, goldtheheat.com. Click on support. Find all the ways to support us. Support step number one. Email us, goldtheheat at gmail.com. Support step number two. Go to your podcast, your platform of choice, and give us the highest rating that there is. But don't write a review. No one ever reads the reviews. Instead, go in there and give us the Jake Jack controversy solve that controversy right there in those comments support step number three check out the patreon patreon.com slash go with the heat you want a free mustache that's how you get a free mustache you check out that patreon we have a level specifically (laughs) for you if you support us enough per month we will send you a business card a skinny tie and a free mustache because you will be our castillo So check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.